it is my very distinct pleasure to introduce Kayleen Lamb again to do, um, we, I called it 2.0, <laughs> data management 2.0. Kayleen has really um, kind of spearheaded getting the software, helping us understand what the new requirements that NIH has. And uh, Kayleen, I'm pretty sure it's a lot of the other federal agencies have this same requirement. Uh, I know NSF isn't quite as sticky about data management plans, but I think they're going to probably follow suit to some extent. So anyway, Kayleen has expertise in all this, um, and also she's talked to a lot of people since the last time she was here. So she knows what are some of the common questions that people have had. And the idea was for any of you who are submitting in June or resubmitting in July, uh, you can make sure that you know what you're supposed to be doing. So, Kayleen Lamb from the library, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Gregory. Um, so this is going to be the interactive part, and I apologize if you hate this part of webinars, but um, this is where we're going. Um, I mainly just want to get a read of the room to know who was at the January uh, DMSP. Uh, presentation or saw it on like a recording. So yeah, so if you could either uh, raise your hand like Dr. Cards did or under the reactions button, there's also a little check mark that says yes, and then X that means no. So if you could just choose one of um, the check mark for X um, or raise your hand meaning yes, or an X meaning no, that you are not here. And I'm going to actually wait till most everybody has answered um, just so I can figure out where, what would be the best use of our time today. So it looks like a few of you have, we'll give it just a few more minutes. Okay, um, so you can go ahead and clear your answers by clicking on the raising hand button again or the check or the X. Um, and so today I've kind of prepared two different possibilities. So this is going to be a choose your adventure of what you would like to hear me talk about for the next 30 minutes. Um, both discussions will have something to do with the frequently asked questions that I've gotten over the past six months. Um, both of them will also talk about the different tools that we have. However, would you all like more information, like a more in-depth dive to what the NIH policy states, the different kinds of elements that are part of that, as well as an example of what a DMP looks like? If so, go ahead and choose the green check. However, if you would like, um, like maybe you've already spent some time looking at it, and you would like a, a broader overview of just research data management, the life cycle, its practices, um, and kind of a bigger picture of research data management, can you go ahead and pick the, um, the red X? So if you would like a deep dive into this is what the policy states versus this is what um, research data management is and the best practices, um, either choose the green or the red. And that way we can kind of go from here. And I will just choose majority. If anyone's very interested in the other presentation, I can give you my notes. Um, it's all scripted, but I want to make sure that I'm addressing the correct information or what most people would like to hear. If you don't vote, other people will get to, to make that choice for you. So. Okay, I'm going to give you 30 more seconds and I'm just going to be quiet and it's going to be a little awkward, so apologies. Again, voting to either get a deep dive into the NIH policy or more a discussion about research data management and the research data green for the policy, red for the life cycle. And all of these can be found in the reactions button at the bottom of the screen, the green check and the red X, 10 seconds. Okay, 
it looks like we have more greens than reds. So if you all wouldn't mind clearing out your greens and reds while I go ahead and start the correct presentation. We'll talk about the NIH policy as well as any recent frequently asked questions that I've gotten. Um, again, if you are interested in more of the, um, the other option, I am very happy to share any of that with you as well as any um, of the slides that I've created. So hold on one second as I have too many screens going on and I wanna make sure I share the correct one. Mm -hmm. And can someone give me a, Paula, can you give me a visual of whether or not you can see that? Okay, excellent. Okay, so today's objectives. Um, we are going to go ahead and do an overview of the 2023 NIH data management and sharing policy, which went into effect January 25th of this year, in case nobody is aware of that, of that fact. Um, we'll also today identify whether or not um, the policy, you should be able to identify whether the this policy applies to your particular research and begin to start thinking through the data management cycle. And then finally, we'll utilize and review the HSC tools that we have, different softwares, as well as some library resources and some of the FAQs that I've received from researchers. So maybe some of their questions will be helpful for what um, you might have on your mind today. But before we get into the main focus of today's session, I do again want to briefly uh, discuss the why for the new regulations. I think sometimes we um, are told what we need to do um, and might not understand the larger context or need to be reminded the larger context, especially when if we are having to do an extra step um, that we're not used to. And essentially, um, data management plans, DMPs or DMSP, so data management and sharing plans, um, their whole goal is to um, create and share data with fair principles in mind. And this is something that the NIH um, has really thought about. Um, and fair principles essentially help the, re the optimization and reuse of data. And to do this, data needs to be findable with good metadata, it should have a persistent identifier, and placed in a searchable um, location. So even if you publish something somewhere, if nobody can find it, it's not, um, it's not good data management. Um, data should also be accessible for both humans and machines to be readable. And it should be able to be retrievable from a trusted repository or source. Data should also be interoperable. So lots of different people on different applications can use and understand their data. And then finally, it should be reusable with a clear understanding of how to legally use while meeting um, the scientific standards of, of the day. So the NIH's new policy is based on these principles for researchers, and their goal is to try to have transparency about how federal funding is being spent, as well as promote reproducibility of scientific research and reduce any sort of research redundancies. So um, what's in the new DM, uh, NIH's DMSP? Um, essentially, the policy states if you're applying for federal funding of any amount, and you will be producing scientific research, then you need to create a data management and sharing plan to submit with your application. Data management and sharing plans are brief documents. They say two pages or less. So it's a short document that essentially says, I've thought through the entire life cycle of my data and I know how I'm going to manage it. So I'm not just gonna have it on a USB drive in my office and that's where the data lives until someone asks for it. Not saying that anybody here would ever do something like that. Um, so the new NIH um, DMSP has two main components. You first create your plan to submit with your funding application and then you comply once that a plan has been approved. Um, I will note that today's discussion is essentially for the minimum requirements for the NIH and other policies um, with more stringent rules may apply. So um, depending on where you're getting your funding, they might have slightly different, um, a slightly different ask when it comes to a data management and sharing plan. On the screen is a snapshot of the template questionnaire. 
that you can find on the NIH website. And today I'm using little snippets of Dr. Colon Perez's DMP, um, which he gave me permission to use throughout um, this presentation as an example. So before you start creating a DMSP, you first wanna make sure that it applies to your research. Um, if you're applying for funding through the NIH of any amount and will be generating scientific data, again, that's an important part, then a DMSP will be required when you're submitting your proposal. This is an update to the, 20, the 2003 data sharing policy um, that only impacted research over 500,000. So this is for a $25,000 grant, you still have DMP. Now government funding can include grants, contracts, proposals, intramural research projects, as well as any other funding agreements. Um, but it doesn't apply if your study will not generate data like the list that I have on the screen. And I believe Dr. Gregory and I were talking about it earlier today. So the NIH realizes that not all data will need to be shared. However, all data will still have to be managed. And so that goes into your DMSP. Under the policy, the NIH uh, defines scientific data as data commonly accepted in the scientific community as of sufficient quality to validate and replicate. Um, so essentially, if you are creating scientific data, you will need to share the data so others can validate or replicate your study results. But what exactly needs to be shared? Um, this is one of the frequently asked questions that I receive. And unfortunately, I don't have a great clear answer. Um, from the NIH website, they state that they expect uh, the researchers to maximize the appropriate sharing of data. And this means sharing as much as you can while also taking into account any legal, ethical, or technical factors. Um, and data also has to be shared even if there's not a publication or if your experiment produces null findings. So um, I don't think people are always so happy with my answer, um, but this is kind of a, a squishy gray area, um, but you need to make sure that as you are publishing any results um, and you're sharing things, you're sharing enough that um, people can replicate and validate um, your findings um, as much as you possibly can. And that's the NIH guidance. Yes, I have a question. So can you hear me? Yes. So you no, know, recently some scientific journals have been demanding our raw data. So is that uh, something that needs to be shared here also, or what exactly is this, uh, you know? Yeah, so for your, for when you create your DMP, um, you can tell uh, what kinds of data you plan on sharing. So if you're wanting to publish in a specific journal and they say, we want all of your raw data to be published in a specific repository, you can then write your DMP saying, I will be sharing all of my raw data and I'll be putting it in this repository. Uh -huh. So if there's a specific journal you're wanting to, to publish in, your DMP can kind of follow that. If the journal doesn't say you need to publish all of your raw data, then you can decide if you want to aggregate some of your data, if you want to do a summary. But again, you need to provide enough that other people could validate your results. Okay, so I think uh, this journal made my life easy since I already <laughs> gave them all my raw data. No, just had to quote that, I guess. Yeah, so you just, you would essentially have that in um, in the data type. And we'll, we'll go into more detail right. of where you would put that in a DMP. Sounds good, thank you. Yeah, thanks, great question. Glad I could answer that one. Okay, so there's a few reasons uh, why a researcher might not be able to share their data. And this mainly applies to any sort of informed consent or privacy concerns when working with human subjects. Uh, it may also apply to any other laws or regulations that prohibit sharing or that that data cannot be put in a digitized format, quote, with reasonable efforts. Um, so if any of these limitations apply to your research, uh, that doesn't mean that you don't 
create a DMSP, rather you would provide any justifications within that DMSP of why you would limit that sharing. So again, um, the NIH doesn't expect you to share all of your data, but they do expect you to manage all of your data. And so you would include that in the DMP. I think the easiest part is what don't you have to share? Um, so under this policy, it only applies to digital data that results from your study. This means that if you were working with something like blood or eye samples, that wouldn't be shareable. However, as soon as you ran that sample through whatever test you're performing, any of those digital results would fall under the policy. Um, other things that the NIH says you don't have to share are things like peer reviews, plans for your future research, uh, your lab notebook, um, and any sort of like communications you may have with colleagues. Um, there are, of course, extra costs that can be associated with making data accessible and reusable. Um, and researchers can actually request funding in the budget sections to help offset costs for data management, sharing, and archiving. Um, these requests could be for any of the following, data curation, formatting or de-identification of your data, transmission and sharing through repositories, uh, prepping your metadata, or any information infrastructure for local management and preservation. Um, all of the funding, if you are granted funding for data management, it has to be expended during the performance period. So if it's like an ongoing cost for a repository, um, you wouldn't necessarily be able to continue to pay for it using that grant money like 10 years out if your grant is only a three to five year grant. Um, some requests uh, can not include infrastructure costs um, that are included in institutional overhead, for instance, um, fa facilities or administrative costs, as well as costs associated with routine research conduct. So if you're trying to gain access to research data and you, it, they're charging you to access it, um, as well as any sort of costs that are double, double charged or inconsistently charged as direct or indirect costs. Now I get quite a lot of budgeting questions from other people, um, often asking if there's some sort of template or um, how much should I should I request for, you know, to offset these costs. And again, I don't have a great answer. Um, however, there are some resources that are available. Um, there's a a budgeting template, a book, and a video that was put out by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I've linked to that on my research data management guide, which I can show you where that lives later um, at the end of this. But essentially, um, there's a book as well as a template that might help you figure out about how much you should ask for your budget. Okay, so now let's go ahead and do a, a deep dive in what to what actually goes into your data management and sharing plan. So the DMSP requires researchers to think through six data management elements. I call this the who, what, what, where, when, how, and why of data management. And so essentially there are six different things that you need to address. And so the first one is data type, and that's our what. So data type describes what kinds of data will be managed and shared. Our related tools, softwares, and code describes the how. So how will others be able to understand the data that you have produced? Uh, data standard answers another what. Um, so what standards will, you, will be used um, for the scientific community? Um, preservation, access, and timelines describes the when and the where. So when and where will you share your data? Access, distribution, and reuse describes the why. So why won't certain parts of your data um, be shareable? So that's where you would address any sort of limitations. And then the oversight describes who. So who is involved in overseeing your data management? Um, and we have more language that I'll get to in just a bit. So data type. Um, Data types will help you describe the amounts of data, the kinds of data like the modality. So are you creating imaging data or genomic data or survey data? Uh, what level of aggregation are you um, creating? Are you doing individual aggregated summarized data? And to what 
processing degree will you um, be using? So like the question earlier, is this going to be all of your raw data or are you going to process it and then um, share that? And then in this part, you'll also want to say which data will be shared and which data will be preserved. So here's where you're going to um, include any rationale for data that won't be shared, um, which we discussed earlier. So you'll provide any sort of justification. Um, so maybe you will share just your process data, but it's going to be cleaned because of um, some of it has uh, human identification. So there's like HIPAA policies that go with that. Um, so that's where you would put um, why you might be omitting some parts of your data. And then finally, you're going to describe any metadata standards or other documentation that will help others interpret your data. Um, and so this includes metadata standards, study protocols, code books, um, any sort of data collection instruments. One question that I've received in the past is whether I can help calculate the total amount of a variety of data files. And they did a long list of like videos and different imaging and some SPSS files. Um, and although if you can see on the, the screen here, uh, this is the DMP by Dr. Colon Perez, he does give it a gigabyte approximation, but he also says that he's um, collecting data from 96 rodents and he tells you how many scans per, an, um, per animal. I've seen other NIH examples where the amount only included the number of videos or images rather than an actual byte size. So it didn't necessarily say terabyte or gigabyte range. Um, so regardless if you choose to include a byte size, um, this is all an approximate approximation. Um, and if there's any issues with the DMP, um, say you don't put in a bite size, your program officer would definitely be able to give you further guidance before that would get approved. Uh, the second element is tool softwares and code. And this one's pretty straightforward. So will um, people need any sort of specialized software to use your data? So if, show, if so, you wanna make sure to list uh, those tools and include how someone would be able to get the software. Um, this would also include if you plan on doing any sort of homegrown tool um, and how you would make that available for others to use um, to understand your data. This helps, especially um, if you use a proprietary software that goes out of business and make sure that your, your data is usable for the long term. The third element is data standards. And this is how you're planning on describing your data. Um, so are you going to do um, certain data formats? Uh, are you going to uh, add readme files or data dictionaries? Will your data have an identifier? Uh, is there any other sort of data documentation like a data dictionary that you're going to include alongside of your data? You also want to indicate um, if there's not a consensus where the standard exists. Um, and as you can see in the example on the screen, um, they're going to be using BIDS standards. Um, and when I met with Dr. Colon Perez, he said that he was interested in a specific repository and this was the data standard that they used. And so sometimes um, if you're looking at a specific place where you want to share your data, the repository will determine your data standards. Um, sometimes there won't be any data standards to use, um, and in which case you would just say that in the DMP. So the fourth element is preservation and timelines. And here's where you name your repository or repositories if there's going to be multiple ones. And then you describe how your data will be findable. For instance, does the, does the repository assign your data set a unique identifier or does it have any sort of indexing tools? So this goes back to that FAIR principles part of making sure that the data is findable. Um, and this is why we um, highly suggest um, putting it in a trusted repository because trusted repositories will have some sort of ways to make your data sets findable. Um, for those who don't know, uh, just a general definition, a repository is a place where you can um, archive or store your data if it's a data repository. Um, ideally, when you're looking for a repository, you want it to be an open access one so it's not behind a paywall, and you want it to be subject specific if possible. So if you're doing brain imaging scans, you want it to live with the other brain imaging scans if possible. Um, 
The NIH has a list of desirable characteristics for choosing a data repository, especially if nothing seems to quite fit your needs. Um, and this list includes things like, um, does the data repository plan for a long-term sustainability? Um, or is it going to go out of business in a few years? Is it free and easy to access? Does it have clear use guidance and does it have a retention policy? So if a repository has thought through some of these things, um, those are all very good signs that you can um, probably trust them with your data sets. The NIH and the National Library of Medicine also have a list of approved repositories on their website. Um, I've linked to them in my research data management guide. Um, which I'll reference multiple times in this talk. So apologies in advance. Um, so you'll also want to say when and how long your data will be available for other people to use. In this section, you will also want to identify any differences in timelines for a subset of your data um, and then provide any reasonings for releasing your data at different times. The NIH also encourages that you share data as soon as possible, but no later than the time of your associated publication or the end of your performance period. The NIH also encourages preserving data for as long as, quote, they anticipate it being useful for the larger research community, institutions, and or the broader public. Um, one of the frequently asked questions that I've received um, is whether I can recommend a repository, especially if their research doesn't seem to fit in a specific scientific one. Um, my generous recommendations right now tend to be Figshare um, as well as Dataverse. I chose those because Figshare will um, incorporate with Lab Archives, which is a tool we'll talk about later. Um, and Dataverse is a repository solution that HSC is currently looking into for publishing data sets. Um, so that might be a good one for people to use as well. Um, but some of what I've seen in some of the, the DMPs is I plan on putting it in this repository and it will be made available for as long as the repository exists. Or to this day, I have not known this repository to purge any data sets. Um, so I've seen some of that language and some of the template language that has come out through the NIH. Okay, element five is um, where you would describe any considerations that could limit your data sharing. Uh, this could include informed consent, laws, regulations, and policy restrictions. Um, and you'd also want to describe in this section um, how you plan on protecting the privacy and confidentiality of your human subjects if you're doing human subject um, identification, or not identification, research, human subject research. The last part of your DMP is the oversight part. And so this uh, essentially is where you describe which persons will be involved with overseeing the data management process. And that is to make sure that people stay in compliance. And so we have some template language that lives on our research guide, uh, which I'll show you later. Um, but the language was written from the research office and um, it should provide a good starting place for this final element. Um, but you can see uh, Dr. Colom Perez use some of the language that we've um, already crafted here. Okay, so after you create your DMSP, you submit it alongside your funding application. I will say that plans, um, the DMPs are not normally part of the peer review process at this time. So your peer reviewers will comment on whether or not they think your budget is appropriate but they don't actually score your DMP. The NIH program staff will review, uh, request any sort of adjustments, and then approve plans prior to receiving your award. Once the plan's been approved and the funds are awarded, it is then time for you to manage and share your data as described in the plan. So if something ever needs to change with your plan, know that there is the ability to do that. However, any of these changes will need to be justified and then Reapproved, um, so you'll need to make sure that you're proactive to work with your program officer to obtain that modification approval. Also, all the updates for your DMSP should be included in your annual progress reports. Please note, and this is my um, broad discussion, that um, 
or broad reminder that non-compliance has a big impact, um, not only on your potential future funding, but it also has Im it can also impact future decisions for all of the the place where the researcher is. So UNT HSC um, could have some penalties if uh, our researchers are not complying with the plans that were approved. And this language is taken on the screen is taken directly from the policy itself. Okay, so before we open it up for any other questions, I wanted to briefly share a few more uh, miscellaneous FAQs that I've received since beginning this journey. Um, some are easier than others, so we'll start with an easy one. Does the new policy apply to a grant that they've already been awarded? So this question in context was, I'm coming up for my yearly review. Do I have to create a DMP for this grant that I'm partway through? And the answer is no. Um, this only um, this plan or this policy only applies to um, any sort of grant submissions post January 25th, 2023. Um, second one is a pretty easy question. Do I have any DMP templates or examples ready to share? And that's a yes. Um, the NIH actually on their website has different kinds of templates that are broken out um, depending on the subject. So they have like a, a human, um, human research template where someone has done like a mock um, DMP as well as there are um, some template language in the DMP tool, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, but all of that can give you ideas of how you start to craft your DMP. The other question that I've received is, can I recommend any specific language when writing multi-PI, multi-university project and grants? This one was more of a maybe. Um, I can't necessarily say this is what you should use, um, but according to some of the FAQs that are on the NIH website, I can confirm that one grant equals one DMP. So if you're working with multiple people, you don't all create your own DMP. One person does the DMP. Um, and then within that DMP and that oversight section, if another university or another PI is going to be um, doing most of the data management and collection and the analysis. If they're touching the data, they need to be listed in that oversight section. Um, but uh, you also want to make sure that you're communicating with those uh, colleagues to make sure that um, you're both on the same page for what the DMP says. But can I tell you exactly how to word it? Probably not. Um, and the last one was, can you make sure my DMP is adequate for the NIH requirements? This one is also hard to, to say, um, mainly because I don't know what adequate is and um, I can maybe provide some suggestions because I had the time to, um, but helping write someone's DMP or looking it over to say like, yeah, this looks good um, is kind of above my purview. So I'm very happy to um, possibly suggest grammatical errors if there's space on my plate. Um, but uh, there's really only one of me um, in the library that's working on uh, research data management. And so I don't really have the capacity to help review uh, DMPs. So um, that unfortunately was more of a, I'm sorry, I really can't, can't help you in the level that you, that you are, um, that you're needing. So um, those are some of the questions that I've received. And let's go ahead and before we um, kind of shift to maybe like some live demo, does anybody have any other questions that maybe I can help with? Yes, Dr. Krishnamurthy. So uh, previously we had the resource sharing plan and we mentioned about sharing cDNAs, DNA sequences. And so is this in addition to that or does this substitute for that? Okay, can you say that again? I'm sorry. Previously, when we did our grant application, we had a section, last section called resource sharing plan. Okay. So now what we have here as data management and sharing plan, is this in addition to that or, or does this replace that? 
So I'm not exactly sure if anybody else has more wisdom about this. I'll let you hop yeah. in. This is a specific one of how you're planning the data um, that you create. Re regarding these two documents, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I am applying uh, a grant. I contact NIH about this question, Dr. Chris Namorzi. These two documents, one is data management sharing, the other one is resource. Okay. The resource, you, you need both documents. Oh, okay, okay. I, I can't tell you an uh, Resource may be the third line you generated uh, and other uh, re resource, the, the, the mouse, the transgenic mouse you, you generated, this is kind of resource, these are two document. But in that, we used to also talk about RNA-seq data and that we are sharing and all that, no? Yeah, RNA-seq data is data measurement, data sharing. Okay, you deposit okay. it into uh, GEO. This is, uh, this is not a resource, this is data sharing. Okay. Did Dr. Cunningham want to add something? I just was going to reinforce what Dr. Hu said, uh, that uh, he's right. Uh, your RNA seq data and genomic data would end up in your data management and sharing plan, whereas it would have been a resource before. But if you're creating an antibody, a cell line, or a transgenic model, then that's still got to be in your resource sharing plan. So I'm not sure why they started a separate one since we are already making a statement about sharing cDNAs and RNA seq data. And so, so uh, at the American Physiological Society, one of the architects of this policy made a presentation. And I think the long term goal with data management and sharing is to get us to eventually agree on and abide to a single standard for okay. large data sets to better facilitate data sharing. Okay. So one thing they could wave a magic wand and say you guys have to use the same standard tomorrow but instead of doing that they're rolling out this policy and letting the institutes decide and eventually the scientific community over time create their own standards that they might begin to ask people to adopt as one of the steps that needs to be taken to facilitate individualized medicine and to leverage all the data that people are making available. Well, got it, thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Cunningham. Uh, hey, Nim, can I say something? Sure. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. This is the first time I, uh, last time I missed. I, I just have two requests. Uh, I'm submitting a ground that's then nine is uh, May 16th, last Tuesday, but I have to upload over the document no later than next Monday. I one request, can you send me your presentation file <laughs> today so I can check the detail? This is the first. The second, I have prepared my data management plan, plan but uh, uh, you, um, have a lot of learning, do a lot of research. Are you able to read my document, two-page document, and give me some comments and input? Um, I might have some time. Um, you can definitely send it over, but uh, Dr. Cunningham is hopping on. Um, yeah, so. Kaylee doesn't really have the bandwidth to take a look at your data management plan other than to make sure that it's complete and you've got information for all six of the areas that you're supposed to cover. If you want somebody to take a look at it, uh, you know, either maybe talk to your chair or talk to me. And if yeah. you give it to me in enough time, I can take a quick look at it. But what you have to understand is, every institute kind of has their own standard. And even if I think that your data management plan is okay, your program officer might decide that they want something different. Uh, that's not gonna impact your priority score. 
that can be something that we can address together at the time that you get your notice of award and we put in, you're just in time. So what I'd recommend would be, you know, use the data management planning tool and generate something that looks like it meets all the guidelines. And then if you're concerned about having somebody look at it, we'll find somebody to, but it, at the end of the day, we're gonna get an opportunity to address any concerns that they have at time of award so that it's not gonna keep you from getting funded. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's fine. I, my chair and other friend helped me uh, already, but uh, I just think uh, more people uh, read <laughs> because this is the first time we do this. Uh, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. If you don't have time, it's fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's like we're going to try to help each other as much as we can. But uh, like I said, it's not going to keep you from getting funded. And we can help you all the way along the process. So if you get stuck and you're uptight against a deadline, it's better to go ahead and get it submitted with the idea that if the Institute wants us to change it, they'll let us know when you get your NOA. Okay. Okay. Yeah, great. And um, as soon as, if nobody else has any questions, I can show you a few other tools that might also be helpful um, that have some more um, like template language in case you need to um, do anything different with your DMP. But I can definitely send you, uh, Dr. Hugh, uh, the, the slides from today after, okay. after this is finished. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions that I or Dr. Cunningham can answer? Okay. Um, so um, here's a few other tools I think that might be helpful for you. And then I'll briefly discuss them. And then if you all still would like to stay on, I can show you how to access them from our library website. So the first one is the DMP tool. Um, and as uh, we were just talking about this, uh, the DMSP policy um, is different for a lot of researchers and a lot of people are doing it for the first time. Um, however, the DMP tool is a really good tool that can help with um, creating a, your DMP. And so it's a web-based tool, it's free to use um, and What's really pretty or beautiful about it is that it will actually provide template language specifically for this NIH um, policy. And I should say that um, each template has a date and a version on it. So if the policy ever gets tweaked in the future, you'll just want to make sure that you're using the latest version and um, make sure that that template is the correct version. Um, you can access the DMP tool from the library's website on our research management plan guide. And the only thing we ask is uh, when you're creating your account, if you could use your UNT HSC email, um, that would be great. It's the only way that we can separate our statistics from Denton. And I'm very curious to see how many of our researchers are actually utilizing this tool. Um, one FAQ that I have gotten is, do they, do you have to use the DMP tool? Is it necessary? And um, short answer is it, it isn't. Uh, if you want to create your own DMP without the template language, that is completely fine. However, I found um, a lot of the people that I've talked to that are, are creating this research data have been, um, have found it really useful um, with at least giving them some words to begin with. Uh, the second tool I wanted to highlight is Lab Archives. Um, so Lab Archives is a cloud-based electronic lab notebook. Um, the library currently manages it, but it's actually funded through the Office of Research and Innovation. It's essentially an online file cabinet is how we talk about it on the, the guide about it. Um, 
but it holds multiple projects or what they call notebooks. So each level of your notebook can be granted permissions um, by the owner to share with different researchers within your lab. So that way all of your research data is in one place and then the correct people have the correct level of access to those. Um, one important aspect to lab archives is the ability to publish data sets, which we are currently in the process of setting that up. And so um, once you publish your data set, um, it goes through a quick review process and um, then it'll be ready to deposit into a repository. Um, the final tool that I'd like to just mention, which I've mentioned multiple times today, is the research data management guide that we have at our library. Um, it is a librarian, AKA me, curated toolkit, and I'm, try to make it so it will make your life easier. Um, and I did this because um, by linking out to lots of different places. Um, so you want to figure out where to find repositories. There's a repository section. There's a budgeting section. Um, we've got lots of links to the uh, sharing NIH page, um, as well as a link to lab archives. Um, it's got a specific language for the 2023 DMSP, as well as um, some trainings and past webinars that I've done. It also has that oversight language template for your sixth element for the DMP. Um, and so I'm really hoping this can be a good like one stop shop for everybody as they work through um, writing a DMP possibly for a first time. Okay. So I decided to create um, a little researcher here. Um, it's a UNTHSC researcher, if you couldn't tell by the lime green pants. Um, but I thought it might be helpful to show what, um, this, what this process could look like with the tools that we have. So say we have a researcher, we'll call them Dr. Jane. Uh, Dr. Jane is um, found a grant that they are wanting to apply for. So it requires a, a DMSP. So they use the DMP tool to write the DMSP. Um, and during this time, they've thought through their, their sharing plan and found a good repository that's going to be a good fit for their data. They're thinking through what software they need to run for their analysis, and they're applying data best management or data management best practices. So everyone on in their lab is on the same page. So they submit their DMSP with their grant proposal and huzzah, they get funded. And um, there aren't any revisions that are needed for their DMSP, so they get the green light to begin their research. So they set up their lab archives account, they grant the, the level of access needed for each member of their team, and they begin to run their experiments. Um, now, even if their experiment doesn't provide groundbreaking research, um, maybe they're close to publication or the end of their funding, so then they submit the greatest level of sharing, according to the NIH, of their data to be approved by the research and innovation team. So they want to submit their data set for publishing approval. Then the research and innovation team will check for any intellectual property issues um, before approving the data set to be published. And once it gets published, then the researcher is able to deposit their data set and all of their associated metadata, protocols, readme files, and data dictionaries into the repository of their choice. And that is essentially it. The data is then findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, um, and it will help other scientists create new discoveries and breakthroughs. So to wrap everything up, and I guess we can go to a live demo if um, everyone would like to see where some of these tools live. Um, but let me just recap really quickly. Um, the new policy is the minimum requirement for the government grants that are awarded after January 25th, 2023. If you're applying for other grants um, from other places, they might be more specific, um, but this is getting everyone to a minimum level of data management and sharing. To do a DMP, you plan and budget for data sharing, and then you submit that with your application and make sure once it's approved to implement it. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to be compliant um, as it could have consequences for not only your future funding, but HSC as well. 
We do have some helpful resources called DMP tool, lab archives, and the research data management guide, um, which you can either scan the QR code that's on the screen, or you can go to um, type in the URL, uh, which links to all the resources that I've seen today or that I've spoken about today. So um, I can either stop now and pause for more questions, or I can go ahead and walk you through some of the resources. What would, what would you like? Do we need new, we can do another poll. Walk through resources. Walk through resources. Thank you. Thank you for, okay. Let me go ahead and stop my share. Oh, geez. Sorry, I have too many tabs open and too many screens. Okay. So let me go ahead and share a different screen. Do, 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 do. And we will share. this one. Okay, so this is our library homepage. Um, apparently, we are getting a new website in July, so things might move around slightly. But what you're going to want to find are these guides and tutorials. So if we go to all guides, we will scroll down to research data management. And we'll go to this page. Um, you can also bookmark this page. So if the library website does change, you can still get access to this. Um, so this is what I'm calling the, the one-stop shop. Um, so hopefully it has um, some good um, information. Um, Dr. Uh, Gregory was talking about different fe uh, federal funding agencies. Well, Spark, which is um, an open access, uh, not company, um, organization has compiled a list of sharing requirements by federal funding agencies. So you can definitely check that out. That's an interesting part. Um, we also have a link to DMP tool down here. I've got some copyright, Creative Commons, uh, Lab Archives links as well. Um, so you can kind of read through these. Um, and we've linked to different things. If you've got five minutes, I think this is a really hilarious um, data sharing and management. Uh, it's pretty old video, but it's still really relevant. Um, so under the data management plans, we have our NIH data management and sharing plan policy for 2023. Um, in this, it will give you, um, it will link to the uh, sharing website. Um, it, I've also linked to where their sample plans are online. So if you wanna see that, um, as well as a link to DMP tool again, this gives you information about the six different elements that are needed in the DMSP. Here is our beautiful uh, template for um, when you're crafting your oversight section. And again, this was um, a kind of a brainchild of Dr. Cunningham's uh, team and the library helped um, clean some of it up. Um, if you want to watch the January Research Cafe, for those of you who missed it, uh, you're welcome to do that here, um, as well as um, download any of the slides that I've done. I've tried to make it as available and accessible. And because I am a scripted kind of presenter, it has all my notes in it. So you can read it as a transcript, essentially. Here's the budgeting section that I briefly spoke about. Um, it will link out to some of these resources and downloads. So here's the, the framework PDF. Here's your, how that, how they tell you how the framework works in a video. And this is an actual book from 2020. It's a free download and it, um, is, uh, the challenge of forecasting costs when it comes to data management and sharing. So if you have some time and want some light reading, uh, it's got some interesting information in that one. Um, we, I'm going to skip DMP tool really quickly and go to our data repositories. If you've never deposited your data set um, in a repository, please know that we're happy to help try to find a place um, for your data sets to call home. Um, 
the NIH has one, but a new, um, something new that I found out, the National Library of Medicine actually has a repository list, and it's much more comprehensive than the one on the NIH. So if you go to the NIH and you can't find a subject-specific one, check out the National Library of Medicine. It's much more robust, and I just found out about this a couple of weeks ago, so I think this can be a really good source to try to find um, all of those are searchable. So if you're looking for human data or non-human data, um, these kinds of uh, searches will help you with uh, repositories. You can find other things through other repositories as well as data standards through re3data.org, um, which is uh, a really good tool. I've also um, have other sort of free courses if you're interested in copyright, um, citation, um, again, DMP tool. Um, there's some just uh, general courses, mantras of research data management training. It's free online course uh, for those who are new to research data management, um, as well as some of our friends over at the um, Institutional Review Board. Um, so I tried to make this as an, an easy place to be able to find uh, different resources. But if you all would like, I can go ahead and open up DMP tool and show you what, what that looks like when you're writing a grant. I think that was helpful last time. So I'm gonna have to take off, Kayleen. Okay. Um, I'm at a conference and I'm due to go back to the session. So if anybody has any questions, uh, just go ahead and email them to me and CC Kayleen, and I'll see you guys all when I get back. Thanks, Dr. Cunningham. Enjoy your conference. Do I need to stop, or should can we show DMP tool and then be done? Let's just show it. Okay. People have to go. They can go, but that way we can. It'll be on the recording for sure. Oh, sure. Okay, so this is DMP tool. Um, uh, you uh, sign sign up. I've already signed up, so we're just going to sign in. As you can see, I've created lots of different uh, tests. Um, but essentially, you come to a, a blank dashboard and you can choose to create your plan. And so if we just call this DMSP 2.0, um, you can select your primary resource organization, which is UNTHSC. And then here's where um, you start with your primary funding organization. And depending on what you choose here will uh, give you different kinds of templates that you can use. So I'm gonna say I'm creating a DMP for this uh, funding organization and I'm going to create my plan. I will say they have lots of different templates and each of the templates kind of uh, are dependent on whoever created them. So if you're applying for funding that's not NIH, that template might not be as robust as what you see here today. Um, but this is one that's um, it's based on the new DMSP 2023. You can put lots of information into your DMP, um, including when you plan on starting. You can invite other collaborators to work on the DMP, um, give them different kinds of permissions. But what I really wanted to show you was this right plan part. And as you can see, here's our six different um, elements part of the NIH uh, DMSP. And so if you expand it, um, this is going to tell you what goes in this data type. Um, so it's going to say how you describe your data. Um, over down here, it gives you an example answer. So if it's basic sciences data um, versus if you're working with human subjects, um, and so it just gives you kind of a plug and play, which I think can be really nice for people who are just starting um, when writing a DMP. The other really uh, cool part about this is we have these guidance and comment section. And so if you have any questions about, I can't remember what data type was about, um, it gives you some NIH guidance um, that also links out to the NIH. Um, it also shows you in like genomic data. 
And so um, it will provide both um, DMP tool guidance as well as the NIH guidance. And um, you can then comment with collaborators. I think this is a, a new part of it. Um, but this essentially has this kind of guidance for each of them. I've looked at a few different DMP templates. Um, I created one for a RDM class that I did not too long ago, and not all of them are this robust. So it's, it's nice that they've given you example answers where you can then just fill out what you need to. And then once everything is done, and scroll, apologize, um, you can then finalize your data. Uh, you can make it public if you want other people to, to be able to see what a DMP can look like. You can also search for other um, public DMPs. Each of them are written by other researchers, so some of them are good and some of them are not so good. Um, but you can also look at uh, what other people are doing. And then, of course, you can download it um, in different kinds of formats with different kinds of fonts. Um, which I know can be important to certain um, certain grants. Um, so this is, I think, a, a really good tool. It's pretty user user friendly, um, and then it also, um, once you've like downloaded it, um, it gives it a number. So then you can kind of keep track of that. If you also want to upload that into like lab archives, you can do that as well. So that's a DMP tool. Um, and here's the research management guide. And I think that's all that I was planning on showing. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Well, and it's pretty rare that this group would be quiet. So you must have answered all their questions or else they're just or the question. <laughs> I guess people don't know what to ask now. It is too too new and you know. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, Ragu, I think the, the point that Tom made is a good one. You know, they're not gonna hold up somebody's uh funding just based on the data management plan and if it needs fixed it can get fixed after um i think you know even nih is trying to figure out what they want yeah and then in that uh, workflow that you showed uh, you know finally when you, you know submit data for approval in you know, lab lab archives and ultimately it goes to research and innovation are they digging in to see if there is a gold mine or something um, not necessarily. Uh, if it is an NIH grant, um, we like you have to share it. Um, however, if your project is in conjunction or you're also funded by a private uh -huh. corporation or something, there might be something in that um, in your agreement that might limit that sharing. Oh, okay. And so it's it's more it's more about that than just making sure that we're not stepping on the toes of any sort of um, previous agreements we have with outside funders. That's not the government. Oh, got it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and Dr. Gregory, I think can um, correct me if I'm wrong there, but it's one of the things we want to make sure that we're uh, good with our partners as well. Yeah. But I guess that's also a window of opportunity to see if there's any patentable material. Yeah. It I, could be. Yeah. Um, I think they said that uh, I spoke with Dr. Cunningham yesterday. I think they'll have a team of two or three that will look at the data sets and ah, then okay. approve them. So it may take just a, a little bit of time for them to do that as they're working out their process as well. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. And like I, like Kaylee said, um, her January talk we've got recorded. It's online. This will be is recorded. It'll be online. And anything else that you might have missed? Patenting one. Although I know you were there, Ragu. Um, and <laughs> that's all available online. So. That's awesome.
I, I think, you know, I think we're just going to kind of have to wait and see what exactly they want. But I think Kayleen was right. You know, what I'm seeing is that each institute is kind of trying to figure out what they, they want for their institute applications. Yeah. Um, All right. if, if I could encourage everyone to follow the link and fill out a survey just to make sure that I'm doing as best as I can. If you have, it's also a way that we can see if anybody has questions uh, or interest in other research data management things, um, but that would be really helpful if you'll take it. It's like three questions, so it should be pretty, pretty quick and hopefully really painless. <laughs> Yay. Well, thanks a lot. Kayleen, thank you again. We really appreciate you keeping us up to date on this and for helping us muddle through this, okay? Yeah, and I'll definitely send out the slides to Dr. Hugh. And um, if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to email me. Um, like I said, my to hsc.edu. Oh no, it's not currently active. No. Uh -oh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Darn it. Okay. Um, shoot. Scratch that. Then we just won't do a survey. Uh -huh. Okay. Want want. Okay. Um, thank you for for letting me know. Um, uh, if you I think it wouldn't be disappointed, we didn't fill it out. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, but yeah, if anybody has any questions or if there's anything I can help with, please let me know. And if I can, I'll I'll do my best to help. So. All right. Thank Thanks. Everybody thank have a great afternoon. You too. Bye. Bye.